Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Vessalatu vesselamu ala Resulillah ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men velâh. Allahümme allimne ma enfa'na ve enfa'na bima allamtena ve zinna ilma. Allahümme allimne ma enfa'na ve enfa'na bima allamtena ve zinna ilma. Allahümme allimne ma enfa'na ve enfa'na bima allamtena ve zinna ilma. Ve la havla ve la kuvvete illa billahil aliyyil azim. Ve la havla ve la kuvvete illa billahil aliyyil azim. Ve la havla ve la kuvvete illa billahil aliyyil azim. اللهم صل صلاة كاملة وسلم سلاما تاما على نبي تلحل به العقد وتنفرج به الكرب وتقضى به الحوائج وتنار به الغائب وحسن الخواتيم ويستسقى الغمام بوجه الكريم وعلى آله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Thank you for having me and hosting me to this uh, blessed event Let's keep this real simple I'm just going to begin by talking taking a dive into the seerah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and let's the pearls that come out of that come wherever they come we'll do that for about 30 minutes and then we'll open the floor up to everybody to, to talk and to say what you want to say and bring up whatever topics you want to bring up so we'll have a free-flowing session, but we'll let the seerah of the Prophet and the various anwar that, that emerge out of the seerah take us where it takes us. Because that's, that topic is prophetic guidance. You just dip your hand into the guidance and see whatever comes out, comes out. And something that has been on my mind in the past few days was to go over one of the most stressful, scary periods of time for the Muslims. And every period that's of hardship brings forth a great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Sahaba, they got one of their best tazkiyas from Allah. Tazkiyah meaning a word of, of, uh, uh, of validation, praise. They had one of the best words of praise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to them after one of the scariest moments. One of the scariest few days in the time of the Sahaba was during the Sulh of Hudaybiyah, what we now call it the Pact of Hudaybiyah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was promised by Allah a Umrah. And the dream of a righteous, the dream of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is wahi. And this Umrah was obstructed by Quraysh. When they found out about it, they obstructed it. And so the Prophet ﷺ decided to send Umar ibn Khattab to inform Quraysh that he wants nothing other than to peacefully honor the house. He wants to make Umrah in peace. And that they have nothing except the weapons of travel and they have with them the animals of slaughter. They're going to slaughter afterwards. Of course, the slaughtering later on in the tashriya was rendered for hajj. But at the time, they were going to slaughter. Just as in hajj, we slaughter the udhiyah. Umar ibn Khattab himself knew his own temperament and said, O Messenger of Allah, I'm not the right one for this. Number one, I don't have much family that can stop them from abusing me. Umar had a tribe. It wasn't one of the biggest clans in Quraysh. He himself was a major personality, but his clan was not a major clan. So he said, instead, send off men. The theologians and the ulama, they like to discuss these things. Is it possible that the Umar knew better who to send than the Prophet ﷺ is not as we study in Aqidah that Fatana, intelligence, the highest level of intelligence is a necessary attribute of every Prophet. The necessary attributes of every Prophet are four. One of them is Fatana. One of them is Tabligh al-Risala, that he passes on the message. One of them is Sitq. Anything that he speaks of is the truth. And it doesn't mean he intends the truth. It means it is the truth. Because unlike English, honesty and lying, an honest person can make a mistake. We call that mistake kevin, even though he didn't intend 
to tell a lie, his, the, his words miss the target of the truth, which is that the Qur'an is never wrong. The transmission of the Qur'an is perfect. So that's the sitq of the Prophet. The Prophet doesn't make honest mistakes, genuine mistakes. Whatever comes out of his mouth is actually the truth. And amana, he's, he, he can be trusted. Okay? He can be trusted. And from that comes that he obeys the divine law. So, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab suggests Uthman and the Prophet agrees to Uthman. So, could it, theologically speaking, does Umar know better than the Prophet, peace be upon him? Or is this an instance in which the Prophet وسلم, was elevating the rank of Umar? And on top of that, the, the decision of Umar ibn Khattab, we can't say if it was the best or not, because when Sayyidina Uthman was sent, a great fear descended upon the Muslims as a result of that. Why? Sayyidina Uthman was sent as his temperament is soft, his temperament is kind, is amicable for discussions. When Sayyidina Uthman arrived, he also has a huge tribe. The entirety of the Bani Umayyah is his tribe, it's his clan, clan within Quraysh. You have the tribe and you have the clans, and then you have the branches, which they call Fakhr. So, he goes, time passes, and, ev and the rumor spreads that Uthman has been killed. Which alarmed the Muslims, and they realized Quraysh is out for blood, and we have no arms, no shields. We're wearing ihram. So that precipitated for the Muslims a period of days of great fear that Quraysh can actually finish them off. They're sitting, as we call it, they call such people a lame duck. We wouldn't call the Sahaba and the Prophet a lame duck, but it's an expression in English. You're sitting there on a pond, a duck on a pond. How, where can you go? Duck, they can't fly. They can only move at a certain speed and they're easy to pick off. So the Sahaba lived at that period, that period of time in this great fear so nobody can say that Umar was right and the Prophet was wrong. But the Prophet did establish that he does accept the shura of the leaders amongst the Sahaba. He accepts their shura. He accepts their suggestions. But what did that suggestion lead to? A great fear that we thought Uthman was killed. When that happened, the Sahaba began to realize they're really nearing death. They could be killed. And the Prophet ﷺ called on all of the Sahaba to tell them to take an oath from them. And some people said, later on they said, this was an oath to die with the Prophet, peace be upon him. But Jabir ibn Abdullah said, no, there was no such oath to die. Because in fact, legally speaking, that's not even a matter that's in your hand. You can't take an oath on something that you can't do. So the truth of it was that person, that Sahabi, was summarizing the feeling. The actual wording of the oath was that nobody abandoned, abandoned the position. That's something you can take an oath about. Can't take an oath for someone, I take an oath of you, don't get sick. It's not in my hands. I take an oath of you to not leave this building, that I can take an oath on. So we even get a fiqh on oaths just from that discussion. There's a legal discussion on what you can get, what is a valid oath. Anything that's an oath for something that you can't do and you can't control is not even an oath. It's not an oath at all. I, I, I swear uh, an oath that a bird doesn't come into this building. It's not in our control. It's invalid completely. Oaths have to be either something I do or something I don't do. So Jabir ibn Abdullah clarified exactly what the oath was. The oath was, nobody leaves. Nobody abandons this position that we're in. So some of the other Sahaba felt that that basically means, even if we have to die. So that's why he expressed it that way. But the actual wording is, Allah nanfir, that we, la uh, nafir, that we don't flee from this position. Fleeing from battle is one of the mubiqat and is punishable by death. Why is that? When you flee from battle, you're leaving your other soldiers, your colleagues to be killed. 
if 10 people go in a battle against 10 other people and one of, one of the, our soldiers leaves, he's basically put us at a disadvantage. So it's akin to murder. Fleeing from the battlefield is akin to murder. Because essentially, you're undermanning your army and causing them to be killed. You can be the reason that they're killed. So, they take this oath, and at the, after this great fear, this height of fear when their hearts are in their throats, so much so to reinforce their iman, the Prophet ﷺ takes a second bay'ah with them. An oath that they don't leave here. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that oath in Surah Al-Fatih. Qad radiyallahu anil mu'mineen. That's all you need. That was the reward. And that was the reward they got afterwards when Surah Al-Fatih was revealed. Those three words, four words. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّدَرِ فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes why He is pleased with the Muslims. Because He knew what's in their hearts. What was in their hearts was an amount of fear that you can't summarize in words. That was one of the things that's in their hearts. He knew that you had that fear, yet you stuck with it. And he knew what was in their hearts was a full loyalty to Allah and His Messenger People can love many different things, but the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is proven by will you disobey Allah for those things. You hear the verse, these verses, that about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then Allah clarifies the love of Allah being that قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ or uh, إِن كَانَ آبَاءُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاءُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ if it is that your children and your parents and your families and your clans and your businesses and your homes and all these things are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger then prepare for punishment. And the pre preparation for punishment is left empty. فَتَرَبَّصُوا it's more scary. Just wait until Allah's affair comes down. So the fuq ulama said, what does this mean? How do I have love of something more than something else? If you would do something haram, if you would disobey Allah, and you would not fulfill an obligation for the sake of what you love, then you, lo then you do love that thing more than you love Allah. If you will restrain yourself from the prohibitions, and you'll fulfill your obligations, then you do love Allah more than you love these things. So Allah Ta'ala in this ayah affirms that a human being can have multiple loves in his heart. I love Allah, I love his messenger, I love myself, I love my business, and I love a whole bunch of people, and I love a whole bunch of other things. The proof that your love of your creator is first and foremost is not in your words, it's in your actions. And if a person loves something so much and they've dedicated their time, then Allah will test that person so that he knows where he stands. He'll test you. You love your kids so much, he'll test you with your kids. You'll be in a situation where I have an obligation in the, in the religion or I have the happiness of my kids. I have to make a choice. I have a fork in the road. Now, if you're, you have wisdom, or you have a wise person, maybe you can manage both. Sometimes you just can't. It's just a fork in the road. And which one am I going to choose? Allah is testing you. When Allah did this for Prophet Ibrahim, all the people, they say, oh, this is the, one of the cruelest gods you have. When they say, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, had to slaughter Ismail to prove his love of God. They say, what kind of God makes you slaughter your kid to prove your love for him? We say, you don't understand. You don't understand some of the spiritual realities behind the human heart. In this, when Prophet Ibrahim السلام, was commanded to do this, the reality of it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for Ibrahim السلام, that anything that comes upon his heart becomes a reality. Beyond du'at mustajab, 
beyond dua mustajab. Dua mustajab, a wali can have that. What is the difference between dua mustajab and what Prophet Ibrahim received? Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, his maqam was that nothing passes by his heart except Allah brings it into the creation. So, how does that happen? That happens because a person will contradict his whims. You'll go against your whims and towards the pleasure of Allah over and over and over until you have aligned your heart directly under the qada and the qadr of, of life. Directly under. You're like a mirror of the book of destiny. This is like some mystical talk of the Arifin. You, will do, you continue to move away from your nafs until your heart is directly under the book of destiny. Every, any idea, any thought that comes onto your heart is coming directly from the book of cre- destiny. Allah al-Mahfuz. Directly from Allah al-Mahfuz. Hence, it's not that you are making a dua, then Allah creates it. No. It's already willed, and all that your heart can sense is what Allah has already willed. That's the, the, the actual reality behind divine will and ijabat al-da'wah. How is it the Prophet ﷺ says there's going to be a man who says, who swears by Allah, Oh Allah, you're going to do this. And Allah fulfills his oaths. How does that happen? When we know everything is by Allah's will. What it is, is that that person's heart is aligned with the divine will so much that all that this heart receives and all that settles inside this heart is what's maktub. Is from, directly from Allah al-Mahfuz. He may not sense that. He just senses, I want such and such. He doesn't realize. As soon as it enters the heart of such a arif billah, it means that Allah has already willed it. It's already something, a will that he's seeing. So when Allah Sa'ala commanded Ibrahim salam to slaughter Ismail, he wanted it the heart of Ibrahim alayhi salam to be in absolute perfect, perfect accord to the divine will. The only way he could do that is to go against everything that he possibly loves. Sacrifice everything you possibly love. From that day onwards, every time Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina Ismail would raise their hands with a dua, yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would respond to him, Qul wa sal tu'ata. That basically he is told, you no longer have to pray for something. You say it and it will come. You say it and it will happen. That was the reward. So what Allah was, do, was doing with this slaughter of Sayyidina Ismail was elevating his maqam. To the point, he is beyond mujab al-da'wah. He is beyond, لو أقسم على الله لا أبر الله قسم. Who, who, who swears by Allah, Allah Ta'ala will fulfill his oath, he's beyond all that. What he thinks, Allah Ta'ala grants him right away. That was the maqam of Sayyidina Ibrahim. How did he attain that? By consistently going against his ego, constantly against his nafs. We, as regular people, we go against our nafs, not the way Sayyidina Ibrahim did, that was wahi. We go by following sharia, then we follow the sunnah, then we leave off the makruh, the discouraged things. We constantly, then we leave off heedlessness to remembrance until we've, we've moved or we shifted ourselves to be directly in accord with the divine will at every turn. Then we become mujab al-da'wah. Your da- all your dua is answered. It's because what Allah has willed for you becomes beloved to you. So you pray for it. You imagine, I got this idea, I'm going to pray for it. That's how you imagine it. The reality of it is, it's already willed by Allah Ta'ala and that's the only thing that your heart loves now. Your heart only loves something that's already willed for you. So you ask for it. So it appears to the person that he's asking for something and Allah is giving. In the reality, Allah is placing in his heart what he has already willed for him. And the, the dua of the arif is just a humility and tadallul. So when this happened to the sahaba, and their alima ma fi qulubihim, he knew that they were in the highest state of fear that they were going to be killed, yet they chose the Prophet and they chose Allah and they chose the bay'ah with the Messenger over their own lives. And the reward they got from that was 
الولايه for all of them full sweep لقد رضي الله عن المؤمنين Allah is pleased with the mu'mineen and is Allah pleased with somebody who is not a wali this is and that suhbah is higher than wilaya even suhbah al-rasul is higher than wilaya Imam al-Nawawi has a discussion that he goes back and forth with Imam al-Juwaini on can a wali know he's a wali one of them the ulama said no because then he would just rely upon that he's a wali who's close to Allah and he won't do good deeds. The wali is someone extremely close to Allah who is destined for paradise. Can a wali know he's a wali? So the first group said, no, it's not possible because if you knew that you were a wali, you would relax on the religious law and on the efforts of worship and you would just coast on it. The other group said, in the Imam al Nawi amongst them, they said, hold on a second. A companion of the Prophet is higher than a wali. And all the companions knew they were companions. And the truthful is, a wali, if someone truly is a wali of Allah, his knowledge of being a wali would increase him in taqwa, would increase him in gratitude, would increase him in worship. He wouldn't be worshipping, he would be worshipping more out of gratitude. And he would still fear the fire because Allah commanded fear of the fire. This is the... On top of that, the Sahaba, many of them knew that they were granted paradise. The ten, of course. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Sa'ad, Sayyid, Talha, Zubair, Abdul Rahman, Ibn Awf, Abu Ubaidah. On top of that, Bilal ibn Rabah knew he was granted paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, Bilal, why is it that I hear your footsteps in Jannah? The Prophet ﷺ was shown the footsteps of Bilal in Jannah. So clearly, this is an ishara from Allah to go ask what is it that Bilal is doing that made him shown to the Prophet? Why didn't I see Abu Bakr? Why didn't I see Uthman? Why didn't I see Ali? Why Bilal? So Bilal, why is it that Allah shows me you in paradise? He says, O Messenger of Allah, there's nothing different between me and the Muslims except one thing. Before Islam, I was a slave. I was not given water whenever I wanted to. As a result, I would get bloody noses all the time. Always get a bloody nose. If you live in the dry climate like Mecca, you naturally you always get bloody noses. They get bloody noses so much that the vessels never heal in their noses. Constantly breaking and it becomes a problem. When I became Muslim and Abu Bakr freed me and Islam commands will do five times a day and the, sah- the way of the Sahaba and the Prophet in that time was they never prayed upon wudu, they always made wudu for Salah. I would now snuff water in my nose and my bloody nose problem stopped. See, we don't understand this. Like, okay, what's the big deal? No, a bloody nose, if you get a bloody nose every day, you have a big problem. Those blood vessels, they don't heal normally. You have a constant blood is coming in your mouth. It's a massive problem. So Islam cured this problem by making me make wudu, snuff water in my nose, moisten up these blood vessels. They healed. They, I stopped getting bloody noses. So now... Every time I make wudu, I pray two rakas. Between wudu and salah, I pray two rakas. Shukr for these bloody noses. How small is that? It's not, it's not changing the universe, right? It's not changing life. But for him, between him and Allah, that was a big deal. And Allah rewarded him that vision of the Prophet ﷺ in paradise for that sake. Just for that. You see, Sayyidina Ali says, you look around yourself and you imagine yourself to be a little germ, little body in a big universe. Rather, you are greater than the universe itself. Inside you is stronger than the universe itself. And we have uh, isharat in the Quran of this. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. If the Quran was revealed upon a mountain. What would you find? You find this mountain rent asunder, crumbled. Khashia, it would come down. The whole mountain would come down. Mutasaddi'an, cracking. It would crack. It would crack and open up and it would be complete rubble from khashiyatillah. Khashia comes down, mutasadda, cracked open. Not went down into the earth as is, no. Cracked up and flattened if the Quran was revealed to the mountain. And what does Allah say? We have revealed this Qur'an, O Muhammad, unto your heart. 
and we never saw the heart of the Prophet وسلم, crack or rent asunder. The human heart is stronger than a mountain. The heart of Iman is stronger than a mountain. We, Sayyidina Ali, he has the most amazing statement of strength telling us what is strong in this world. And he first says, the mountain is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared as one of the greatest creations. The mountain is one of the strongest creations on the earth. But metal can break a mountain. So metal is stronger than a mountain. Iron, uh, fire, can melt metal. So fire is stronger than metal. Water can put out fire. So water is stronger than fire. Wind could evaporate water. So wind is stronger than water. Human beings put up walls. So humans are stronger than the wind. Alcohol knocks out human beings. Alcohol intoxicants can destroy a human being. They knock you out. So alcohol is stronger. Intoxicants are stronger than human beings. Sleep is the cure to intoxication. You sleep off your intoxication, so sleep is stronger than intoxicants. Anxiety, alham, anxiety pushes away human sleep. So anxiety is stronger than sleep. And dhikrullah pushes away anxiety. So the strongest force on the earth is dhikrullah. So this incident that happened at this Sulh of Hudaybiyah rendered the Sahaba لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ He knew what is in their hearts. وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا And he rewarded them for this an, an opening. Soon, that first opening was the knowledge that Quraysh will not kill them. That was the first opening. The Fatih. When you feel like you're so in trouble, you're in so much trouble, you're so jammed up that you don't know what the future lies. And then the Faraj comes, that's a Fatih. A Fatih is a victory without violence. A Nasr is a victory with violence. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Mecca was a Fatih and Ta'if was a Nasr. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ فَأَخَّرَ الْمُفَضَّلِ Put the best for last. So, Ta'if was opened with what? A battle, right? Ta'if was a Nasr. It was opened by a battle. But Mecca was a Fatih. It was conquered without violence. So the first one for them was to know that there's not going to be any killing. And then afterwards, the next Fatih, is that this contract between the Muslims and Quraysh, uh, or more importantly, between the Prophet وسلم, and Quraysh, because the contract was not between all Muslims. The contract was only with the Muslims living under the Prophet And the Muslims at this time, when they felt that we have no soldiers, nowhere to go, and Quraysh is right in front of us, we oftentimes feel the same thing. How many times you contemplate life in the Western societies? Maybe, you know, some people contemplate this more than others. And you wonder yourself, where are we going, life in the West? Everything around us is facade. Everything around us is attacking our kids. They're trying to attack your kids. There's no support. The Dharan Islam itself is not necessarily a place of refuge anymore. Even if you wanted to, you think you could? All the people who talk about hijra, show me the visa process to make hijra. You can't just make hijra. Where are you going to go? And what's the visa process for these countries? It's not so easy. Okay. What, they got jujitsu going on over there or what? What's happening over there? Man, they're loud. So, we oftentimes ask ourselves this. But we're not, we're not leaving. There's no... There's no hundred million person hijrah, right? There's no hundred million person hijrah. You could make hijrah if you want. And it would probably, if you're not involved in da'wah, is better for you and for your family.
And there's a reason why the, 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 the scholars forbade living in non-Muslim countries, even if the Muslim country is worse. Reason is that if you live in England and your kid, let's say, we ask Allah and salam, leaves Islam, let's say, hypothetically, right? His kids are also going to be completely out of Islam, right? But if you go to an Islamic country and a person apostates out of Islam, when he has kids, those kids are still going to be brought up in a full environment of Islam. It's the lineage that this ruling is based upon, not the individual. The individual is not the purpose of this ruling, this prohibition from moving. Say, why? I'm the, I can per, worship freely, I'm fine. I'm strong in my deen. Yeah, but if one person from your lineage leaves Islam, the whole lineage is finished. Whereas, that's not the case. You go to an Islamic country surrounded by Islam and Muslims, if one person apostates, his kids are probably going to be Muslim. They don't want to be weird. Right? So it's the, the wisdom of the rulings on the prohibition of living in non-Islamic countries is based on the lineage, protection of the lineage. And the continuation of the ruling is that it becomes permissible by exceptions. And that's for the one who migrated. Most of us, I don't think, migrated. He's just born here. Right? We're born in the West. We're not leaving. We have to realize that we're probably, we are going to go through tunnels through very thin and dark tunnels in the future, but be optimistic that we're going to have futuhat. We're going to have futuhat. Allah did not put a hundred million Muslims in the Western countries for no reason. And cause the unification or the, the separation, the partition from India and Pakistan. That itself led to hundreds of millions hundreds of millions of Muslims to be displaced in Pakistan, overpopulated country. I want to get out of here. That is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to people to leave. Why do you find a better life? You can't just suddenly put a hundred million people in Pakistan and wonder, well, how are you going to have a new country like this? They're, they're jammed up. It's too populated. They don't want to leave. And they did leave. They did leave. Not only did they leave, simultaneously around the same time, as this partition, all the British pop aging population from World War II, and all that population is going down, they need help. So where do they go? To the old colonies. Come, we'll give you passports. We've given out passports like it's free. They've given out the passports. This is all planning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of this plan will happen for no reason. And there was a priest to give you optimism. Here, I'm going to do istishhad with the mukashafa of a priest. There was a priest way back in the time when the French first went down to Algeria and Morocco to conquer these countries and make them colonies. And this priest saw a vision. Now, can a kafir see a true vision? Of course he can. Did not Malik u Misr see a true vision? Did not Fir'aun see a true vision? But Ru'ya, there's Ru'ya Saliha and Ru'ya Sadiqa. And there's Ru'ya Saliha Sadiqa. Ru'ya Saliha is good news to a believer. It's true, it's Sadiqa, and it's Saliha. Meaning, Allah is showing you this, this is the future, and it's a mark, you're doing something good, and Allah is pleased with you. Ru'ya Saliha. Then there's Ru'ya Sadiqa, a dream that is true. It comes to you with the truth. Doesn't mean Allah loves you. Allah doesn't love Fir'aun. And he showed him a true vision. He showed him a true vision of a, bo of a pebble, a, a, a little pebble coming from the lands of the Philistines, the lands of Bani Israel, coming and becoming fire. And then landing in Egypt and burning the entire country down. They interpreted it. They said, one of the boys of the Hebrews will rise up and destroy this nation. That's when Fir'aun said, we need to kill all the boys. They started killing all the boys. And then when they realized we need labor, so they killed the boys every other year. And Allah made Musa 
to, be, to show you the Qudra of Allah, He made Musa to be born in the year in which they're supposed to kill all the boys. And then Allah Sa'ala sent Musa alayhi salam to put him in the, in the ocean. Put, put Musa in the, in the sea. O mother of Musa, put him in the sea. Put him in the sea. Like a guaranteed death now. And where does the sea go? Does the sea take him far away to a righteous person? No. يَأْخُذْهُ عَدُوٌ لِي وَعَدُوٌ لَهُ Who's going to take him? A Rajul Salih? Who's going to take him? A pious person? Who's going to take Musa alayhi salam from the, from the basket? from the Mediterranean Sea. Is it going to be a righteous person? A supporter of Allah? A believer in Allah? Another prophet? No. His enemy will take him. Show you. You can't stop Allah's plan. You cannot stop Allah's plan. My enemy and his enemy will take him. Fir'aun himself takes him. SubhanAllah. وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي why did, she, why did the mother of Musa and all the girls that were working for the, for, for the wife of Fir'aun, the wife of Fir'aun, why did they take him and they loved him so much? Because Allah says, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي I placed love all over you. That means anyone who sees him loves him. So the girls, some girls working for the wife of Pharaoh, they're out at doing whatever they're doing at the tip of the uh, water at the Nile not the Mediterranean it was the Nile and they picked him what are they fishing washing clothes who knows they see it. what a beautiful baby there's a million babies they love this baby why? because Allah put in their hearts to love this person anyone who had a clean heart loved Musa right away automatically took him into the house well let's go back to this French conquest this priest he's a non-Muslim he sees a true dream and what's the dream? The dream is, he says to them, he says, don't go and do this mission with the Muslims because I saw a dream in which we sent our armies and then I saw giants, giants dressed in Saracen clothing marching upon our country and we can't stop them. We couldn't stop them. They're going to take over our country. And these countries, all these European countries, their population is shifting. So, we'll close with this. The summary is, think about the sulh of Hudaybiyah, because it was a time of great deep, great hardship between the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, between the promise of Allah and the tanjiz of the promise. There is a promise and then there's the actualization of the promise. There's qada and there's qadr. There's suluhi and tanjizi. What this means is that Allah Ta'ala may will a thing. Yet, the will of the creation of the thing is later. We're in that situation. We're about to really embark on one of the most amazing centuries for Islam in the Western Hemisphere. But between that, and between us actually seeing it may be like what these Sahaba witnessed at Hudaybiyah. Hardship, patience. You may think there's no chance, we're finished. Yet the Fatih is going to come to us. All we have to do, we don't need master plans. We don't need master plans. All we need to do is practice Islam. And it's not one of us, and it's not one organization, and it's not one champion who's gonna do it. It's millions of people living on Islam will be the proof of Islam. We will prove to the society as they go down the route of following desires and worshiping desires, we're going the, the path of worshiping Allah and following the Prophet ﷺ and following that law. Let society, let commonsensical people see for themselves. Which reality do you want? A reality which astaghfirullah is becoming a freak show. The society is becoming a freak show. Things that you never imagine is something that would possibly exist if, you, if now you don't affirm it and confirm it and support it and love it, you're like uh, outcasted. Well, hold on a second. Why am I outcasted for not affirming something that didn't even exist 50 years ago? But that's the way it's going. So let the comparison happen. And commonsensical people who are close to nature, they're going to let them see the communities.
consistently the Muslim communities don't have certain problems and they do have certain good qualities. Their kids are good to them. Their households flourish. They take care of their parents. Basic things. These fundamentals. And we are just one out of a hundred million, each one of us. But it's the hundred million that's going to compound to prove the point. We can open up.